We are excited to continue in this series in the Gospel of Mark, looking at the person of Jesus Christ. And we're calling this series the beginning of the gospel because that's how Mark begins his book. In chapter 1 and verse 1, he says, this is the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ. It's about Jesus himself. And after Jesus is consecrated for ministry, he's baptized, he's going around preaching the good news of the kingdom. In, in chapter 1, verse 15, this message, we're told, is, is repent and believe the gospel. The gospel about Jesus. Jesus says in chapter 1, verse 38, that's why he came. And we see his authority. We saw last week his authority to forgive sins. He knows men's hearts. We see his authority to teach, to define religious practice. We see his authority over demons and his authority to heal. And we're going to look at that in particular tonight. And th that authority draws the crowds. They've never seen anything like that. It draws our attention as well. And Mark, the writer of this gospel, is drawing us to ask, who is this man? Who is he? And here in chapter 5 and verses 21 through 43, we're introduced to two very different people from opposite ends of society. And I just want to pull out three key verses, three key moments for us as we look at this text together. The first is in verse 24, and it says simply that Jesus went with him. You see, Jesus had just come back from the Decapolis. He's come back across the sea and he's on the beach and a giant crowd has gathered around him. And as he's standing there, this man, Jairus, comes up to him. This is an important man. Mark tells us that it, he's a ruler of the synagogue. He's a man of status. And he comes up and he throws himself at Jesus' feet and begins to beg him. He humiliates himself before Jesus in front of the crowd. And this kind of man would never do that unless he had good reason. And he does. As Mark tells us, he says his little daughter, Luke in his gospel, tells us that it's his only daughter, is at the point of death. It's an urgent, it's a life-threatening situation. He has good reason to do that. And he has this wonderful statement of faith. He says, Jesus, come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And Jesus responds to his faith. Because Jesus loves to respond to faith. Two weeks ago, we talked about th th that faith can be qualified as a living faith. Paul describes Timothy's faith as a sincere or a genuine faith. It's a faith that acts, that comes to Jesus. In this case, it's an undignified faith. It's urgent. The man's daughter is about to die. She's about to die, and his faith is motivated by that desperation that comes from the prospect of losing something important. It's imminent. And so Jesus responds and he goes with him. But he does something surprising on the trip, the, the trip to get to, to Jairus' house. You see, he stops to respond to the faith of an outcast woman. In verse 34, we see that he says to her, he stops and he says to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. As Jesus leaves the seaside with Jairus, the crowd goes with him. It's thronging around him. It's jostling around him. And Mark introduces us to this woman, a woman who has suffered for 12 years from a discharge of blood. It's long-term illness that's made her an outcast at the bottom of society. It's cut her off from religion and society and family. And she suffered at the hands of many physicians. She's been poked and prodded and examined. And she's thrown away all of her money trying to find a cure. And she's only got worse. And she comes to Jesus. She's heard of him. And she says to herself, if only I touch the hem of the robe. She comes to him with a sincere, a genuine faith that he can do something. Maybe it's tinged with a bit of superstition. But she comes to him honestly. And Jesus stops to respond to her, to her faith, her faith that's, it's the quiet desperation of a woman who's lost everything. And she's trying to hide. But Jesus stops. In verse 29, it says that immediately when she touched the hem of his robe, immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt within herself that she was healed. He responds immediately to her faith by healing her. And then he stops and he calls her out in front of the crowd, not maliciously, but very intentionally. He says, who, 
Who touched me? And the disciples are surprised. And we probably would be too, because there's a crowd around him. Everyone's touching him. And for the disciples, maybe there's a little bit of, there's an important man here, a man of influence, whose daughter is urgently sick. She's about to die. We should, we should deal with that. What are you talking about who's touched you? They're worried about public image a little bit. But Jesus doesn't play favorites. He always has time for someone with a sincere, a genuine faith. Always has time. Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and may, and are, are, have fallen short of the glory of God. There is no distinction. And in that respect, faith is a level playing field. Jesus doesn't play favorites. And so he stops and he calls her out in front of the crowd. Again, not maliciously, but very, very intentionally. And she comes out in fear and trembling because she thinks she's been caught out. She thinks she's going to be humiliated and shamed and rebuked in front of the crowd. But that's not what happens. Jesus restores her publicly. He deals not just with her physical illness, but he deals with her shame, her humiliation as well, in front of the crowd so that they know. And he says to her, daughter, it's a term of, of, of compassion, of endearment, precious child. He shows us the father's heart. Your faith has made you well, he says. Your faith, not magic or superstition, your faith. Jesus is the good physician. He heals. He's compassionate. He doesn't charge a cent. And then he says, go in peace. That's this idea of shalom. It's the wholeness that comes from being in right relationship with God in Jesus. And he says, go and be healed. He's already healed her, but he, he has the authority to say that, to heal. Paul in Colossians chapter 1 verse 20 says that through Jesus, God has rectified all things to himself through the blood of his cross. You see, it's the blood of Jesus that gives him the authority to heal. It's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us. It's the old song we sing. What can wash away my sin? What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. He has authority to heal. And he doesn't just heal physically. He heals all of her holistically. And then Jesus moves to continue his journey. And this brings us to our third key moment. In verse 41 and 42, he reaches down to the little girl who has in the meantime, she's died. And he touches her and he takes her by the hand. And he says, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk around the room and they were immediately overcome with amazement. Why were they amazed? Well, you see, as Jesus got up to leave after he had had this encounter with the woman, he got up to go to continue to Jairus' house. But some men came and said, don't bother the teacher anymore. Your daughter's already dead. There's nothing more he can do. And Jesus overhears them and he says, oh, don't fear, only believe. Trust not in what you can understand from a human point of view, but trust in me. That's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, walk by faith, not by sight. Jesus challenges them, don't fear, only believe. And he leaves the crowds behind. And he arrives at Jairus' house and there's more crowds. They're paid mourners, but they're, they're not genuine grievers. And he gets rid of them as well because he doesn't want to deal with the crowd. He wants to deal with people who have a genuine, a sincere faith in him. And he's always got time for them. And so he walks in. He takes Peter and James and John and Jairus and his wife. And he goes into the room where the dead child is lying. And he touches her. Normally you can't, Jews would never touch a dead body. It makes you unclean. But Jesus is not made unclean. No, he makes her whole. Quite the opposite. He brings life and wholeness and healing. And he says, little girl, can you hear the compassion in his voice? Little girl, little lamb, precious child, arise. And she does. Immediately she arises because Raising the dead back to life is only as hard for Jesus as waking a sleeping child. That's what he says. And they're overcome with amazement because Jesus is dealing with their fear, a fear that, that drives their faith. They know they need to trust him, but they're afraid. And Jesus overcomes our fear with power, his power over death. Paul says 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5, that our faith must not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Jesus deals with the woman's shame by restoring her honor. He deals with Jairus' fear through his power and overcoming death. And then Mark ends the story and he says, Jesus strictly charged them that no one should know about this. And he told them to give her something to eat. Even in the midst of their amazement, Jesus is concerned for her physical well-being in the here and now. Give her something to eat. She's hungry. He thought she was dead. But she's hungry. What does this mean for us today? Can I suggest to you that we need to experience the living Jesus Christ who by his blood heals us, purifies us, cleanses us, and restores our honor, and who by his resurrection conquers fear and death. I don't know anyone else where we see that kind of ultimate power and authority coupled with that kindness and compassion. He doesn't abuse his power. It's not a wishy-washy compassion. He doesn't play favorites. There's no one else who couples those two things. And Mark draws us to go to ask, who is this man who can do these things, who can say these things and back them up? He always, Jesus always responds to faith. If you have been tracking along with us and you're investigating the claims of Jesus, you're looking into who Jesus is. Is he who he claims to be? Can I suggest to you, can I encourage you, that there's no question more worth answering than this. Who is this man? Can I encourage you to continue on to the end of your investigation to answer that question for yourself? It's worth talking to him about it. Lord, I'm beginning to think that I might need you. I'm curious about who you are. Would you reveal yourself to me? Help me understand who you are. He's there. He'll answer. He's always got time for faith. Secondly, Jesus, by his blood, rectifies all things. He deals with sin and the consequences of sin. James, in his epistle, his letter to the church, he commands the one who is sick to ask the elders of the the, the local church for prayer, to pray for them for healing. We at City Church would love to pray for you, for any sicknesses, infirmities, diseases that you have in any way that you're afflicted. We do believe that Jesus still heals naturally and supernaturally. Sometimes, like in the story, he delays. But he is always good and he cares for you now. Physically, spiritually, emotionally, all of you. And one day, He will heal, maybe not this life, maybe the next life, but he always, he will keep that promise to heal you completely. And we don't need to fear death. We just need to trust in him. So if you would like to be prayed for, send us a private message through Facebook or send us an email at prayer at citychurchwolverhampton.com. I just want to end with this verse from Psalm 103, verses 13 and 14. Jesus reveals the Father's compassion to us. The psalmist describes it well. He says, as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him, for he knows our frame, and he remembers that we are but dust.